Hi guys, in this video we will have a look on how to simulate a fisheye lens for our scene. If you are not that familiar with trigonometry, you may find this video a bit hard to follow in certain moments. If that's the case, don't be shy and ask for clarifications in the comment section. I'll be more than happy to further explain things and link resources. The fisheye effect is the name given to a specific type of distortion of the image, caused by a specific type of lenses used in photography. To give you an example, that's the distortion you get with most of the action cameras, like the GoPro, where the image looks like mapped on a hemisphere. The fisheye lenses are usually used as a way to push to the extreme the angle of view of the camera, making it approach 180 degree. And to make the images look cool too, of course. To simulate it, we are about to create a post-process material that warps the image like it was projected on the surface of an hemisphere. Since our objective is to warp the image, as I just said, we already know that this time all our work will be done on the UVs. The idea is to transform the default UVs, which map the image on a flat plane that is the screen, onto UVs that follow the surface of an hemisphere. Let's start by preparing our UVs for our intervention. Let's change their range from 0 to 1 to minus 1 to 1. Then we need to make the ratio between the U and the V 1 to 1 which means that the UVs has to look like the viewport is always a square. It doesn't really matter if we scale the Vs to match the Us or vice versa, but since we mostly have to deal with the horizontal frames, I'll go with the first option. Let's divide the viewport sizes by its width to have the ratio. and multiply the UVs with this ratio. As you can see, the debug nodes we added before are now displaying only squares with every viewport shape. Now that our UVs are ready to be manipulated, let's first plan for the future and add the inverse transformation to reset them to the correct values we need to display the scene texture. So, let's divide back the UVs by the image ratio and change again the range to 0, 1. So now, if we plug the UVs onto our scene texture node, we should see the image completely unaffected by any transformation. Now that we got our setup, let's start building the hemisphere. This is actually very simple, it just takes one node. Let's imagine that our current UVs are the points of our hemisphere projected on the plane it is sitting on, which is the viewport. So, if we want to calculate their third component, assuming the hemisphere has a unit radius, we just need to derive it as if x and y were two components of a normal vector. If you're having trouble visualizing it, we can try to make a very simple light model to shine onto it. By the way, if you want to know more about how lights are made, check my previous video on cell shading. Now, to convert the hemisphere onto our new UVs, we need to think in polar coordinates. If you don't know what they are, you can think of them as an alternative way of expressing points and vectors. We usually do that in Cartesian coordinates, which component essentially tell us how far from the origin along each axis we are. With polar, instead, we express a point in space by identifying how distant we are from the origin and at which angle. 
Sadly, what I'm going to explain now is not the best way to approach polar coordinates for the first time. At all. It implies a bit of knowledge of spherical coordinates, which we could see essentially as polar coordinates in 3D, and how to translate them to Cartesian and vice versa. That said, let's move on. By normalizing the first two components of the hemisphere normals, we know in which direction our new UVs will be pointing. Now we have to find the magnitude of each UV vector, that should represent how much it is rotated away from the vector that is pointing straight at us, from the center of the hemisphere. Since it is an angle we are looking for, we have to look around and see if we can read the data we are working with as pieces of some right triangle. Because that's what using trigonometry is essentially all about. We already used the first two channels of the hemisphere vector, so we must do something with the last one. If we imagine the xy vector as an arrow that goes from the center of the base of the hemisphere parallel to the screen, we can interpret z as another arrow that goes from the tip of that first one towards us, touching the hemisphere surface, perpendicular to its base. And if we draw another line from the center of the hemisphere base to the tip of this second arrow, we just identified a right triangle. That means we can calculate the angle of rotation of that normal from the pole of the hemisphere. In this case, its z component equals the cosine of that angle, so by using the inverse function, the r cosine, we now know the angle. As you can see, this gradient tells us exactly what we wanted to know. The more the pixel is near the hemisphere pole, the blacker it is. The more it approaches its edges, the whiter. Probably you also noticed that the gradient saturates to white before getting to the actual edges. That's because the arcosine outputs the angle in radians, so the gradient is currently ranging from 0 to half pi. Let's normalize it. Now it's time to scale our UV directions by our newfound magnitudes to finally have the coordinates we were looking for. Let's finally plug everything in the nodes we added previously and see how our scene looks like. The image is nicely filling the entire hemisphere and it is being warped in the way we want. How stylish. But, as you may have imagined though, we're not done yet. Even though the image is correctly being mapped onto the hemisphere, it should be occupying its entirety only with a field of view of 180 degrees. In any other case, it should be mapped on a proportionally smaller section of its surface. Luckily, it will be a very easy fix. See, the image is now on the full hemisphere because of the value we are using to normalize the angle of rotation from the pole. If we use a lower one, the image starts to shrink. So now it's just a matter of passing here the right value. An int can come from the viewport camera setup itself. The zoom of the camera is actually set by the horizontal field of view value, so we could use that to scale the angle. We need to divide it by 2 because, if you recall the right triangle, it goes from the center of the image to the point, while the FOV values refer to the entire image. Moreover, this half of the value is already passed to us in radians, so we don't need to do any further operation. And now the scene is magically adjusting to the field of view we set the camera with. 
That means also that the more we zoom in, the less the image will be spherically distorted, which is an accurate thing. This doesn't imply that you can't hard code the distortion value you prefer for artistic reasons, of course. Now that we successfully deformed the image, it's time to crop away all the useless parts. Firstly, we can crop the image so that its angles will be coinciding with the hemisphere edges. Note that these cropping operations must be done before warping the UVs, when they still refer to the frame plane. To execute this first crop, we have to first calculate how long in pixels the diagonal of the frame is. Then we have to divide it by the viewport width. And divide the UVs by that ratio. This operation will actually scale up our starting image so that the edges of the hemisphere, once the new UVs are computed, will coincide with the frame angles. If you want to set your camera with the max field of view, you can stop here, as the corners of the image will be on the edges of the hemisphere. Otherwise, we still have another cropping operation to do, to compensate for the reduced area covered by the image when using a lower FOV values. This crop operation will be more complex and will heavily rely on trigonometry too. The information we need for it, the diagonal field of view, is not available to us, so we'll need to calculate it first. And to do that we also need the camera focal length, which is another unknown to us. Luckily, this last one can be calculated from the horizontal or vertical field of view. Just in case you don't know what the focal length is, I'm going to briefly explain some photography concepts. To know how much zoom we are going to get from a specific lens, we use three elements that are related to each other. Field of view, sensor size and focal length. Each one of these elements can be calculated if we know the other two. For example, the field of view increases with the increasing sensor size, while decreases when the focal length increases. All these relations are based on trigonometry too, since these three elements are all part of a right triangle. The field of view is the angle. The sensor size represents the cathetus on the opposite side of the angle while the focal length is the one adjacent to it. So, to calculate the focal length, we'll need to divide the half frame width by the tangent of the half horizontal FOV. The very same result can be obtained by using the vertical data. Now we can finally calculate the diagonal field of view by dividing the half diagonal length by the focal length and doing the arc tangent of the result. Finally, we got the angle we were looking for and we are ready to execute the second image crop. To get the scaling factor for our image, we'll need to calculate the sine of the angle we just found and multiply our UVs by that value to zoom a bit more the image as we need. Since with this deformation the image is getting enlarged, especially at the center, you may notice a loss of resolution. To try to hide that a bit, you can turn on the filtered sampling in the scene texture node. And, to completely fix it, you could also think about rendering the image at a higher resolution, if your game performance allows that. Anyways, this post-process could be a nice addition to your games, especially if you have some sort of replay feature that needs some style. 
This is probably the most famous lens distortion, but not the most common actually. Let me know in the comments if this post process gave you some interesting ideas that could be developed, and they will be discussed in future videos.